that was Opus 10. And now, just briefly about the pathetic, because you know it very well, and I don't want to hold you all too long. This was written just a year after Opus 10. It's dedicated to Herzog Karl von Lichnowsky, another great uh, supporter of the arts and music and a great friend of Beethoven's. And its title is already Grand Sonata. Pathetic is obviously not a name given by Beethoven, but he certainly hadn't protested against the publisher's name. And there is certainly something very grand about this and uh, full, of, full of pathos, full of, of grandeur, of, of tragedy, reminiscent of, of Greek tragedies. The whole gesture, there is a, a grave first part, comes the Allegro Molto e Combrio, second section. The, this first part that I just played, Grave, is often thought of as, as the introduction, but I beg to differ because this, this is the first theme. It returns over and over again in this sonata in different keys, and this is, this is not an introduction like later in Opus 111 when you have This will never return after you reach the Allegro. You will never hear this again. Very different with, with the pathetic sonata. Now, the, therefore, although there is no manuscript, it had been lost, unfortunately. So, the first edition puts the repeat sign at the beginning of, of Allegro Molto e Combrio. <laughs> I never forget when I heard Rudolf Serkin play this, and not, not just that he played it most magnificently, but at the end of the exposition, uh, and he went back to the Everybody was shocked, but it really convinced me because it's, it's a different piece that way. Again, we have different proportions, and I feel quite strongly about this, that the repeat must go back to the beginning of, of the piece. Then you will have a gigantic first movement, and that will be counterbalanced by the other two movements, which are 
rather lighter, not lightweight, but certainly lighter by comparison. The dotted rhythms of this pathetic sonata, if you think of Bach's C minor partita, romantic gesture, but it goes back to Baroque and to Bach. So again, it's, it's a very heavy, thick chord, but it starts forte piano. So it's, it's, a, it's a strong attack, and then the dynamic must drop. It's very difficult, but you can do a certain trick on the piano that you attack a chord and you hold it with the pedal and then you repress the keys two or three times again without sound. I, mean, I don't want to sound too technical here, but it's important. <laughs> because you have to achieve this sudden drop of dynamics. Pam, pam. Yeah, that's what he wants. Yeah, and then dissonance. Even more dissonant. Yeah. Now he's pleading, refusal. This is not a virtuoso run, and it should not be too fast, and there is no crescendo. I, I always hear this was a huge crescendo. If Beethoven wanted here a crescendo, he would have written one. No crescendo. Now. And you hear this. It's a tremolando, and it's very unpianistic. This whole sonata, written by this great pianist, is so unpianistic I couldn't describe it. It's, a, it's, an, it's like an orchestral reduction, a piano reduction of an orchestral score. <laughs> and the, the, the Blitz und Donner. And then the storm quietens down a little. Now comes a very different theme. Remember these four notes again. Later will be, and then the last movement is. So again, everything is connected. So. Thing. 
system, and it has to lead into, into the next one. So again, I don't think that a metronomic treatment here is just. <laughs> must yield. It's very orchestral. After we have played the expositions twice, here we have the grave in the dominant. rhythmic uh, form. This is really like the storm in the pastoral symphony. But with this drum roll, like a timpani, like we, have, we have reached already the dominant, and it, it's, the, the return is prepared here, and, but it's very, very long. It's something like, like over 20 bars long. This dominant. Then comes the return. So then everything is quite uh, normal here. In place of the big chord, there is dead silence. One, two, three. And silence. And now we have to take a deep breath. This is one of the best known and best loved Beethoven movements, rightly so, but it should not be 
sentimental. song without words. Again, A flat major, adagio. We had the same tonal relationships in opus 10 number one. But that was an adagio molto. This is tempo ordinario and plays it. This is a, a rondo form with the rondo theme with two episodes. Then the first theme returns, and then comes again a, a second episode with triplet accompaniments. Yep. clarinets. Everything is orchestral. And then this comes again with orchestral exclamations. over the triplet accompaniment from, from the preceding episode. Uh, it's very, very poetic, very beautiful. Then there is a short coda. Delightful final rondo. As I said, the first movement is, is so gigantic that the sec second and third cannot be on that level of gravity. So, therefore, something lighter here. Take to to overplay this movement and to make more out of it than, than what it is. 
It's like when they he he something playful. So um, first episode. He marks again dolce, so it has to have a certain sweetness. not so innocent. Um, then comes a second episode which is very beautiful, very contrapuntal, very Bachian. Uh, two motives which, are, which form a counterpoint which are invertible. Now change rows. This is beautiful when the when the bass takes over. Dolce. of this finale, he justifies the, the name pathetic and goes back to the grandeur that we have experienced in the first movement. <laughs> So this rhymes to that. And, uh, it would be like this, but he combines the two movements. Questions? Two questions. 
questions more? No. So, that's it about it. Thank you.